Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. Uh, today we will have a talk on parenting. And it will be quite a detailed talk on parenting. Um, and, I, you know, I, I've been doing parenting talks in Malaysia for... Uh, I started probably about four years ago giving parenting talks for a bit, where I, I guess to, uh, I, I think I am still director of parent training for a bit, although I'm not very active now because I don't get around so much. But um, my parent training talks used to be very heavily involved with the laws of learning, but my parent my parent training talks now are, are very different than they used to be. And they don't involve the laws of learning so much. They involve, well, you, you'll see, it, 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 it's, it, it's much more about uh, the way people think. Now, when we talk about uh, raising children, we have to give serious consideration to what it really means uh, to raise a child. And even we have to give some very serious consideration to what a child is. Um, I think, I don't know if any, if any, if in any of my previous talks I have said anything about uh, this one quote that I think is absolutely wonderful from uh, Imam al-Ghazali where, where he says that uh, when Allah blesses you with a child, he actually gives you a child with a perfect soul. And this soul is like an uncut precious gem. And the responsibility of the parent is like the responsibility of a gem cutter to shape this perfect but uncut jewel into a perfect uh, and most beautiful and precious shape that is pleasing to Allah. And this is exactly what one of the reasons I like this uh, idea so much is because he is talking very specifically about the shaping process, which is what I talk about in, in raising children. And, and of course the shaping process, I, I'm finding out more and more as I'm reading some of the earlier, uh, early Islamic scholars that virtually all of the laws of learning that I talk about ha had been understood. They were just never named, but they had been understood by, by the early scholars. So. When, when, when you have a, a new baby, this baby is not just a human being, right? This baby is a soul entrusted to you. And as a matter of fact, parenting, well, in, in the first place, I, I, I think I should mention, parenting is probably, it is certainly the number one most important job every human being has is to be a good parent. Doesn't matter what job you have in your life, right? To be a good parent is more important than that. Because, I mean, that, that, that is the whole purpose of Islam and that is the whole purpose of Allah's many billions of years of creation is to get to the point where human beings raise families, where each generation, the concept of Khalifa, is each generation is supposed to be higher in, in, in spiritual belief and practice than the generation before. This, this is the ideal of Islam. And so, of course, your, your main responsibility and, 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 highest response, and highest obligation to Allah is to raise your children right. And I'm sure everybody who is a parent knows this is not an easy job. You know, it's the most important job in the world, 
but it is also one of the hardest. I, I, I think probably most people, if you had to say, what is harder, my job at work or my job raising my children, you're going to say for sure, my job raising my children is the harder one. And so, also, we don't get much help in how to raise children. Um, you know, when, when you consider all the subjects that are taught in school, and, and by the time children leave school, they are certainly all of the age uh, to have children, it, it is notable that there is nowhere in the world that I know of where they actually teach parenting classes, where they teach, you know, children in their, uh, uh, to, to, to the, the skills that it takes to be a good parent. And so here, this most important job in the whole world, nobody gets trained for. And you're just thrown in and all of a sudden, you know, you have a child and what do I do? You have to do something. You know, you can't just do nothing. So you, hopefully do your best and of course most people raise their children pretty much the way they were raised. Actually there's two, there, there's two things that happen. If you were raised reasonably well, you usually raise your children the way you were raised. If you were raised very badly, you still might raise children the way you were raised or you might change and raise them differently. But basically uh, how your parents raise you determine how you're going to raise your children. And when we talk about parenting, we have to consider that parenting does not st start after the child is born. Parenting starts uh, during the whole, whole nine months uh, of pregnancy. Because I don't know exactly what all chemicals are transmitted um, between the mother and the child because I think not every chemical is transmitted between the mother and the child. But I would say that because it is, there are a wide range of, of chemicals and hormones that that that, uh, that differentiate a happy person from an unhappy person, or an anxious person from a uh, relaxed person. And the hormones of, that make people unhappy or anxious, they tend to be, not just the hormones, the various chemicals that are released or, or, or various chemical changes in, in, in the blood um, result in, in really uh, a very severe deterioration in the body's ability to uh, maintain itself in its best state. And so, it is very important for the mother to have a happy pregnancy. And also it is very important that the husband be very kind and supportive so that the mother has an e even better opportunity to have a, uh, a happy pregnancy. And I have to draw my usual drawing on the board. So, 
we don't know exactly when the, the child's, it, the, but so, so we, we do know that, that, that uh, we're, we're hoping that there is a happy and healthy pregnancy, which is very important for the development of the child. I, I notice in Malaysia they, they don't seem to have the same rules they have in the West about advertising, and sometimes you'll see on TV uh, various um, nutritional foods for children making claims that it'll grow more neurons in their brain and things like this. Um, I, I'd say these claims are probably questionable, but, but certainly um, a, a very good diet is, is necessary because the, 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 one, of the, one of the things that, that might be correlated with intelligence is the number of neuronal connections that are in the brain. There is a wide range. Some people have a small number of neuronal connections. Neuronal connections are, the neuron is one, is, is one nerve in the brain, and it may have anywhere from a hundred to several thousand connections to other neurons. The more complex the, the, uh, the sort of dynamic pattern of interconnections is, uh, possibly the greater the, pen, the potential for intelligence, not the greater the intelligence, but the greater for the potential of intelligence. And when they did, uh, I believe, a, uh, uh, an autopsy and then, uh, I forget what it's called, where, where they cut layers of the brain to look at it with Einstein, that they showed he had a particularly high number of uh, neural connections. Anyway, you would like your child to grow up with as many neural connections as possible. And a good diet will certainly help that in the beginning, but that is not the only way to get a lot of neural connections. And then you, you, you then realize that the child comes in with a pure soul, but the soul does not interact directly with the physical world. The soul interacts with the physical world with the mind, and the mind is linked to consciousness, and, and the main seat of consciousness and the mind is in the brain. So the child will, will be having will come in, as they come in as a pure soul, they also come in as a pure consciousness or a pure mind. They will have messages written in there. And, and when they have, when those messages start, those messages don't start after birth. Those messages start being written before birth. This is why it is very important for the child to have a happy environment. And uh, I am not entirely sure that, that this is the case, although logically it is the case, and it is a really nice idea, <laughs> even if it wasn't the case, that for, you know, if, 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 if whatever a mother says out loud is really transmitted uh, very, as soon as the auditory nerves of the child <coughs> develop to the point where, where they make a connection to, to the brain. At that point, the child will start having uh, auditory messages written into the consciousness. And so I think it is very likely a good thing for mothers to do is to, for, for example, read Quran, uh, make dua, uh, to, to be sure the azan is heard, um, important things in Islam. So that these messages, although the child cannot understand them, there is no question that these messages do go along the auditory nerve and do get stored in, in, the, consci in the consciousness. Now, they don't get stored in a way as we, under as we understand them uh, or, or as we hear them, but they do get stored. And what I think is likely the case, because the very early learning experiences are important because there is nothing else in there to compete with them. And so these messages get written in there and they, they are like very deep because they are the beginning messages. Then, when the then after the child is born, I think that there is a great likelihood 
that these messages that were stored in there before the child was born, when the child hears these same things later in life, that there will be some sort of neural connection made and a recognition. And because when a child is in the mother's womb, it is actually a probably a very pleasurable environment for the child. You know, the child will feel warm and comfortable and no displeasure and no discomfort usually uh, if everything goes well. And so while these uh, messages are being heard, like, like, like recitations, you know, uh, sir, or things like that, it is being made in a situation of real comfort and, and, and uh, I don't want to say happiness because that is uh, an emotion that I think we learn later. Um, but it, it is associated with nice things. And so I, I, I think when we, when we consider, when we want to raise a child, we want to consider every possibility to uh, help the child be everything the child can be. So I think it is a very good idea to do, to do something like this. Then when the child is born, as soon as the child, and we know in Islam, I won't bother to go into the few things that are supposed to be whispered into the child's ear right when the child is born, but this also is a good idea, of course. But more than that, we have to realize that Allah has created human beings like, like the child is just like a little bundle of flesh. But it is not like, although it looks like a little tiny human being, it is not a human being in consciousness yet. It is, it is just a, a, a sort of blank organism. But it is a blank organism that Allah has made into one of the most sophisticated learning machines, if, if, I, could, if I could use that term, that, that has ever existed. Uh, I mean, we, we, we cannot even yet conceive of a computer that can learn the kind of things uh, that, that a human being can learn. So this child is, in the beginning, a little bundle of potentials. And these potentials are absolutely every human potential that exists, exists in this child. You know, to be the uh, greatest Islamic scholar in the world. That child there exists with the potential to be that. To be the greatest physicist in the world. To be the uh, various other things. And I, I think I mentioned before that within the potential, it, it is, uh, when, when I talked about the number one tennis player in the world, the child is born, and, and uh, d depending on various, various characteristics, if, if you are very short, you have less chance. If you are taller, you have more chance. But, but for example, uh, with the number one tennis player in the world, there are probably every year a million children born with the potential to end up playing tennis better than that person. I don't want to say playing tennis is a really worthwhile thing to go into, but what I'm saying is this huge potential that is sitting there, right? You have this little tiny baby, uh, about what, three, three or four, about three kilo, or three, three or something, a little over three kilo, uh, better in pounds than kilos. But you have, and, and, and here is this little, little, miniature human being that doesn't have uh, much consciousness yet and this this little human being is sitting there with the potential to be virtually anything but when you but consider how many people in the world maximize their potential see the number is probably not large but I, I, I hope we all know that, that, that part, of, part of Islam is, the ideal is for every Muslim to maximize their potential. 
So Allah wants you as parents to set up a, an environment for your child that will maximize your child's potential. And, and you know, the thing, you, 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 you might, among other things, uh, Did you spell pious, P-I-O-U-S? One more. Uh, caring. Caring is sort of like kind. It's possible. <coughs> anyway, like four, four is plenty. I, I mean, we, we, we could write a thousand. And say, for instance, when your child is born, you say, I really want my child to. Just so we don't get the idea this is inherited. If you want an intelligent child, I guarantee you, you can have an intelligent child if you raise your child to be intelligent. If your child does not have any neurological or biochemical deficits, you can raise your child to be just as intelligent as you want your child to be. If you want your child to have a genius IQ, this is not a problem. It's just a matter of raising your child in, in a certain way that the child will have that. Every single child who has no neurological, let's just say, I won't keep saying this, every normal child, in other words, normal in, in that they don't have any, any physiological thing wrong with them. Any normal child is, can, is, is born with the potential to be a genius. But they are not just going to be a genius on their own. They have to have certain experiences to be a genius. Now, one of the things, in all the things that you want your child to be, you have to consider that you want to start from a very, very early age. And, and one of the things that you want to do is give your child as much stimulation as possible in the very, very, from the very earliest days. I mean, really from the first days. S some people feel funny talking to children, uh, to, to little babies, because they know the little babies cannot understand. And they say, well, what do you say to a little baby? say anything you want to the little baby. The little baby doesn't care. <laughs> you, you know, you just talk. You know, tell them about your life, tell them about physics, t you know, recite Quran to them. Anything you want, right? The important thing is that your child learn to be a communicator. That your child learn that human beings communicate. And the more communication you have with your child when your child is is right from the veriest early ages, right? You, you don't want to sort of wait a year and then start because believe me, that first year a whole lot of learning takes place. So you just start right from the beginning and you just talk to the child all the time. And when the child babbles a little bit, you give reinforcement for the babbling because that babbling will eventually be meaningful communication. And so, it, you, you, for everything that you want your child to be, it is so simple. All you have to do is essentially reward anything that is, is part of those characteristics. And, and also, about the neuronal connections in the brain, that stimulation uh, actually develops neuronal connections in the brain. I, I have actually... It was, it was so amazing to see. Um, w when you get old, you, you don't develop many more neural connections. W when, when you are young, most of your neural connections are made. And it was, it was a, a documentary on. It was one of the most amazing things I have ever seen. They were. They had a, a an 
infant, uh, a couple of years old, old enough to learn a, learn a simple task. <coughs> and somehow they were doing a real-time brain scan at, the, at a level where they could actually see the neurons. And as the child was learning this task, you could actually see neurons developing and connecting with other, neuro, uh, with other uh, through the dendrites at the end of the neurons. The neurons themselves, I, I made a mistake earlier, neurons don't connect with other uh, neurons. At the end of neurons are things called dendrites, like, like little thin neurons that come from the end. And they connect to the other neurons. You actually see them making paths to other neurons. So, I, I mean, we have really direct evidence that this takes place. So every learning task you give to your child, you are building more neuronal paths, or more dendrite paths, or more neuronal connections. So, and, and I, I would assume that these connections are made also by hearing communication, uh, and, and you want to, what, a child has, uh, basically human beings have five senses. You want to, from a very early age, stimulate all five senses. Right? Put different tasting things on the child's tongue, of course, things that won't hurt them, so they can experience different tastes, uh, have them smell different things, uh, Lots of things to see, right? Um, uh, in the beginning, children's vision is not that good, but, but bright sparkly things and things that are interesting to look at and things that move so the children develop visual acuity and, and interest in, in looking at things. And all of these things are building neuronal connections and also a whole lot of physical touching. Know, the, the, the children need to, to uh, as part of the bonding process with, with the parent, and, and as, as part of um, developing the, the, the sense of the nervous, uh, the, the nervous system sense of, of touch, that you want to give the child lots and lots of hugs and caresses and and, uh, and and move the child's arms and legs around and to, to give them experience of this and rub different kinds of textures on their hands. Right? Some people wait until kids are a few years old to do some of this, right? You should really start all of this from, from the very earliest ages because they are not learning it in the way they would learn it later, but they are learning something from it all. And they are learning to experience a world that is full of many, many, many different kinds of stimuli. And they are also developing many, many neural connections. And so this is like the beginning of, of developing a child with intelligence. I don't want to pick that as the only characteristic, but, but uh, this kind of thing certainly helps. So you want you want to, from the very day day the child is born, to, to start being sure that the child gets lots and lots of stimulation through all of the five senses. And then this thing about talking with the child, you want to do this, uh, you know, particularly if you are a mother at home. And, and, and have a lot of time alone with a child. You know, don't just not be talking. Really, really, spend practically all your time talking to the child. Guaranteed, it will benefit the child later in life. Because, and also, it, it will help help in this bonding relationship, which which, which I, I don't know whether I mentioned before uh, that um, about imprinting. But, but I will just mention it again because this is very, very critical that imprinting starts early, but imprinting doesn't, uh, doesn't 
when, when things like ducks and chickens, imprinting happens virtually instantaneously. But with children, imprinting takes maybe five to seven years to, to finish imprinting. And you want to start developing that relationship, <laughs> that bonding as quickly as possible that is going to end up as imprinting. Imprinting is like a deep attachment. With, with animals, imprinting is like just a deep physical attachment. But with human beings, imprinting is a deep physical attachment combined with a deep emotional attachment. And it's unfortunate for fathers that they often don't get as much opportunity to develop the as much relationship with the child as the mother does. So this is why, you know, in, in the hierarchy of things, it's Allah, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mother, father. Um, that this is why the mother is considered so very important in Islam. And, and when when the child imprints on the mother, have I told you about the studies about him imprinting before? Not easy. Some, maybe some, maybe some have heard me. Look, it's, it's brief. I'll just tell you this: that that they have done studies of children when they are maybe eight or nine years old, and you you bring a child into a room, and, and it's a, like a long room like this. Down on one end will be the mother sitting with, and talking to the experimenter. Down on the other end of the room will be uh, a number of uh, toys and things. And so. The, uh, they say to the child, okay, you, you go over there and play with the toys, and, and the mother uh, uh, mother says, you go play with the toys, I'm going to go over here and uh, um, talk to this person for a while. And the children who have imprinted on their, on their, on their mother, they will sit there and play with the toys, but every minute or two, they have a look over at the mother just to make sure everything is okay. Because this link is really important to them. You know, so the, the mother gives them a confidence and an assurance and, 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 and just, just to be in the presence of the mother is a thing of great value. But the children who have not imprinted, they'll just sit there for an hour and play with the toys and they'll never look over once at the mother because the mother has become to them just another person that the mother means no more really or, or little more to them than, than the, the experimenter that, the, that they are talking to and when you really will suffer from this is when your children become teenagers and you want to say to your teenager uh, I have some very important advice to give you and if you have, if your child has had a deep imprinting on you as a mother, this child is going to be very impacted by your advice because you are such an important person in their life. But if the imprinting has not gone on, you may have no more effect than any other person may have, you may even have less because the child may now see you as an impediment or somebody standing in the way of them getting to do what they want. And they don't really care what you want or what you think because that imprinting hasn't taken place. So it is very, very critical to, to have an imp that, that imprinting take place. And as the child is getting older, and, and this, this, this is not always the easy part to do, of course, but say for instance you want your child to be intelligent, work hard, to be kind, to be honest, and to be pious. If you want to uh, have your child be those things, 
you actually have to be an example of those things to your child. We, we all know the, 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 you know the falsity of this statement, uh, do as I say, not as I do. But, but nobody does as you say, everybody does as you do. So you want, you want your child to be these things. You have to be these things for your child. And then there is another interesting thing and, and, and it, it is from, it, 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 it's knowledge of ancient Islamic scholars and it has been proven by modern psychologists with experiments that one of the best ways to get your child, or, or actually not even just to get your child, but, but we're talking about children, so one of the best ways to get your child to be what you want your child to be is to treat them as if they are that thing that you want them to be. So that they see themselves as someone who is perceived by others as, for example, being honest or pious or kind or intelligent or hard worker. If, if when your child is little, right? It, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, if you have noticed how receptive very young children are to where the rewards from the, the parent are. If, there, if, if, if you would like to have your, uh, your, you know, they say children, when they are two, they call them the terrible twos. But they are not necessarily terrible twos. If there are times, it just happens to be a time when the children are learning to explore and, and, and seeing themselves as having a, a personal identity that, 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 that where they can make choices on their own. But if you want your child to, to for example, uh, pick up their toys, if you make picking up their toys a a chore to them, like like it is a hard, like it is something they don't want to do, and you make them do, then they are going to resist. But if you make picking up the picking up of toys a fun experience, and in the beginning both of you together say, "Okay, now we had now we you had fun with the toys. Let's have some fun putting them in the box," and 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 then you you. you uh, the child helps put them in the box, and then you say, "Oh, that's so nice! You know, that it's so much, so good that you do that. You know, it makes me so happy that you do that. And wasn't that fun? You know." And then the child, when they are little, they are very receptive to being influenced in that way, particularly when they are very little. And and these early steps, because you have to remember, the, all of these characteristics that you want, that. What is happening in here is the shaping process. And so if, if, if these five characteristics are your goal, and your baseline is your child when your child is one day old, they are not really much of any of these. And their life is going to be a series of steps toward that goal. But they will only be a series of steps toward that goal, particularly in the beginning, if you organize their life in such a way that those steps are taking place. And so you need to consciously decide uh, what, 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 what kind of things with, with my child will help my child to be pious. Maybe sitting in your lap while you read Quran, or you know, uh, sitting on or lying on the floor next to you while you pray, or uh, so so that the child just gets to keep having inputs. Because you, as you remember, I have mentioned before, the idea of Islam is that. Every,
that every input that comes in from the physical world, the social world, and later on when they can speak, when they can speak to themselves with their inner speech, we want to be good, 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 good messages. And every good message is a message that Allah would want in there. This is the idea of, of what an Islamic family is to be about. It is to be the child's early environment where all the messages that are written in there are positive messages that are consistent with the will of Allah. And you have to understand that your child is, their life, their whole life is a shaping process. I mean, no matter how old you are, right? You are still involved in the shaping process. You are still making steps toward wherever you are going. At any given point, you are the sum total of what is in your consciousness. Every time a new input comes in, you are a different person. You remember we talked before, every time you're a different person, there's only, you cannot be the same when a in, new input comes in. You can be closer to Allah or closer to shaitan, but you have to be one of the two. So on, on being pious or being honest or being kind or working hard or being intelligent, that, that every input related to each of those characteristics that comes in should be a step in the shaping process. Doesn't matter if it's a tiny step, doesn't matter if it takes thousands of steps. I mean, it will take thousands of steps. And, and say for instance with intelligence, one of the things that's important with intelligence is to make sure that children find learning fun. And when children are little, they do tend to find learning a lot of fun. You, you, you know how, how little kids, when they are maybe, after they, they are learning to talk, how you, it seems like you can forever walk around the house with them and say, you know, what color is that? Uh, um, uh, what, what, what is that? And, and get them to name things. And, and if, you, if you act like, wow, oh, okay, wonderful, great, this is so nice, oh, you're so smart, you know, because you, you want them to get a, a perception of themselves as someone who, who is smart. You don't want to lie to them, right? If they're getting all these answers right, you say, oh, you're so smart, you know, uh, and, 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 um, and, and you make all of these things, being pious, being honest, being kind, working hard, and being intelligent, you make them all fun parts of the child's life. Not, not difficult parts of the child's life or, or not things where you get angry if they don't do it. It is very important that the child see these things as fun things in life. Because in the beginning, you can't tell them how, how they are important things in life. But by the way you act with them, they can, in the, as a first step in the shaping process, they can see that they are fun things in life. So all the characteristics that you want to see in your child, you make sure they have opportunities to do them, and you make them fun. And, and um, the, sometimes people think that uh, there are, uh, stages in development and, and that, that uh, Piaget as a psychologist has been the main promoter of the idea that there are stages in development in the child. I personally believe that there are no such things as stages in the development of the child that are physiologically or biologically or genetically determined. I think that what people see when they see they are, there are stages in the child because P Piaget will say, well, I've gone to cultures all over the world and children at five years old do such and such. But maybe the world is set up so that a child who comes into the world as, as someone who is going to learn from the world will on the average at five years old have learned this particular thing just because that is the nature of the relationship of the child to the world. So I, I, I think that some people don't like the idea of, say for instance, teaching children to read at too young an age. Personally, I believe 
a child should be taught to read uh, as early as they can and find it a fun experience. Key, find it a fun experience. You, if you are trying to make them read and they don't want to read, then you are going against, you, you are creating someone who is not going to want to be a reader. But if you are doing it in, in, in a sense to, to make it a fun part of their life, of course they are going to enjoy it very much. And also, uh, even before children can read, it is, it is really, really good to ha have them sit in your lap because children like to sit in their mother's or father's lap and, and go through a book with them. And when you read it to them, you know, if it's, if it's a children's book with, with little, with big words, right, you can actually point to the words or you can start with an alphabet book and point to letters. It doesn't matter that they are one year old they're not, not going to be able to learn it, and they're not going to be able to repeat it. But they are hearing it, and those messages are getting written in their consciousness. It's just that they are, at that point, not able to do much with them. But the messages are getting written in there. And, and, and so, you know, you go through, that is the letter A, see? Like, apple. And then, you know, just, just, and, and you say, provided the child can, can speak at all. Uh, you say, can you say apple? They can say apple, then you make a big deal out of it. If they can make a sound that approximates apple, you reward that. But if you reward that, you have to be really careful that on the shaping process, each time you give a reward, the reward is for further and further progress. In other words, if the child in their first try to say apple goes apple, then you can be rewarding of that. If on their second try they go abba, which is further from it, you, you, you would say no, apple, and then try and get them to do it again. Now it takes a lot of sort of thinking and re memory on the parent's part. But you want to be careful that you are always rewarding steps in the direction of the goal that you want to go. You never want to be rewarding steps away from the goal. But the real key that I say over and over is you have to make everything that the child is doing, that every characteristic or, or, or quality that you want your child to exhibit, you have to, when they are very, very young, Make it fun for them. And you have to do it yourself and make it look like you are having fun too. These things are critical. Because children are very observant. And children can tell whether you are being honest or not. So if you were to eat something that tastes nasty that might be healthy for the child, you eat it and you go, mmm, yum. You give it to the child and it is really nasty. See, the child is not going to think you were sincere with that young next time they see you go young. So we need to be really honest with the kids. So now we, we get the kids when they are several years old and they are starting to become verbal. And here is when you really, really want to focus on lots and lots of communication. But now the communication is to be two-way. You want the children to learn to talk about all sorts of things. <coughs> and, you, and you want to, by the time a child is two years old, there are two kinds of language for children. There is uh, uh, expressive language and receptive language. Expressive language means what they can say. And a two-year-old usually cannot say very much. But receptive language means how much can they understand. And a two-year-old can understand a lot. And you should always ex 
expect them to be able to understand more than they probably can. And, and you work toward, uh, and, and by the way, on, on every one of these goals, we know where to set the goal because Allah, when He told us to be Caliph of Allah, He told us, uh, in the wording of the original scholars, to perfect yourself. So we set every goal at perfection. But we never punish ourselves for not achieving perfection because only Allah is perfect. We don't punish our children for not being perfect because only Allah is perfect. But what we do is we try and notice every positive step that the child makes, make notice of it, and give the child positive feedback so that they know they have made this, this uh, this step. Now, when the children now they are getting a little bit older and they are like say four and five years old, you would be absolutely amazed at the potential. If, if you have been doing all these things that I have suggested, a four or five year old can carry on a conversation that is virtually an adult level conversation and to a degree except for facts that they don't know they can understand logically a large degree in the same way an adult would and so by the time the child is four or five we are assuming all these other things have been worked on you start talking to them and, 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 and certainly by five years old, but by five years old for sure, your child should understand this. Right? That, that, that they have in their head a consciousness or a mind. And they are not going to totally understand what a mind is, but, they're, but you say to them, you, 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 can, you can explain to them how the mind works. You can say to them like, uh, you, you, don't, you don't know, you, you pick a word and you say to the child, you don't know this word, do you? And the child will say no. So you see, so you can say, so in your mind, that word doesn't exist there yet. But we will put it there. So you say, this word means such and such. You say to the child, now what does that word mean? And they tell you back. And then you say to them, see, that is how you put things in your mind. Anything that you want to learn, anything that you want to be, you get it by writing a message in your mind. You say, and you can write all sorts of messages. It isn't just writing messages about uh, how we uh, what the definition of words is, right? You can write messages saying, um, because if, because you explain to themselves also the, the inner speech, and you can say you can say to yourself, I want to be a really honest person when I grow up, and and you can say to them. Uh, because you tell them to talk to themselves with their inner speech. And hopefully by the time they are five, you can have given them some sort of concept of Allah. Of course, they are not going to have a very sophisticated concept of Allah. But they need to have some concept of Allah. And you say to them, Allah gave you this inner speech so you can make choices. And all your life you're going to have thousands and thousands maybe in a long life millions of choices to make and every one of those choices you make is going to move you closer to Allah which is really good or may move you closer to shaitan which is really terrible so Allah gave you this inner speech so you can make a you can make a choice every time there is a message written in your mind do you want to have that message take you to Allah or to shaitan? And if it's a bad message, you erase it. If it's a good message, 
you make it stronger. And believe me, five-year-old children can understand this. And they will talk to you in that language. And what, once you develop that kind of language in being able to talk to your children, it is very effective. Because you are now no longer just saying to them, you should do this. But now you are saying to them, you should do this, and this is the reason why, and here is how you can use your inner speech to, uh, to understand why that is right. And, 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 uh, and, 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 um, and you can say, you, you can talk to them about the fact that, that um, there are rewards for, for these positive characteristics. And you could say, when you were little, I used to give you lots and lots of rewards every time you would say a word right or you would be kind to your little brother or you helped with the work or you, you showed me how intelligent you were by something you knew or, or, or when, you, when, you, uh, when we pray, you always like to pray. And these are all such wonderful things. And, and I have for years and years, I have been giving you lots and lots of reward. I always praise you for it, and I always think it is wonderful. And all my life I will think it is wonderful. But one of the things that you can do is you can learn to praise yourself with your inner speech and realize that every time you do one of these things, you are doing something that is helping to make your life uh, a better life. And, and to move toward Allah. Then other kinds of things that children need to be taught. Children need to be taught logic. You should teach children logic from a very early age because one of the things in Islam that we are, not, that we are supposed not to do with children is we are supposed to not fool, not uh, trick children. And the reason we are not suppo we are supposed to not trick them is because Allah has set up the world for us to um, for us to learn in a certain way, and, and and Allah wants us to expect that what we see is the reality, or what we are told is the truth. But Allah is 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 knows that people are not always, do not always see things correctly and people do not always tell the truth. So children need to be taught logic so that they can make a determination for, for themselves. So you, you, you can say to the child, you know, you can do simple things. Uh, I'm just thinking up a, 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 a very, very simple uh, example because all of these things, you see, the younger you can start with all of them, the more successful you will be. Because the things that you are teaching the children when they are one and two years old, the children just incorporate that into, that's how I am. And so in later ages, you don't really even have to teach it to them because they are that type of person. So maybe you, you, you would have a, a cup and, and, and a marble and, and you put the marble under the cup and you say to the child, can you see the marble? They say no. And, and then, you, then you say to them, uh, is, is the marble under the cup? They say yes. You pick the cup up and you say, yes, see, you are right. And then you don't put the marble under the cup and you put the cup down again. You say, can you see the marble? And they say, no. And you say to them, the marble is under the cup. Is that true? And they'll say, hopefully, no. If they say yes, you say, no, you see, because you didn't see the marble be put under the cup. So you have no reason to think that it is under the cup. 
and you just teach them very simple logic like that. I mean, so simple it seems to us like, like, of course, but to a little child, these things are not of course. This is why Piaget ha ha has this idea that, that, that children uh, cannot make these distinctions at certain ages, but they can make these distinctions at certain ages if they are taught to make these distinctions. And then later on, you, 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 you teach the, the, the children, uh, actually, you, you just keep teaching to the degree that, because eventually, at a relatively early age, you know, because most of you probably haven't <coughs> formally studied logic. So it, it won't be too long until the children reach your level of logic and maybe even surpass it. And, 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 and I hope, you know, everybody could feel the enjoyment of having, say, your seven or eight year old child know more about some subject than you do. See, because this is a real pleasure, and this is the way it is supposed to be in the Islam. Each generation is supposed to be superior to the one before. And actually, uh, we, are, we have reached a time for our, our break, which we will have on time today. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, actually, I would say probably yes, because magic teaches children that things that appear to be uh, things they teach children that things that cannot be seem to be real. So they can get the idea in their head that um, all sorts of things that are not true could be true. See, Allah wants us to have a means to objectively observe the universe. You remember, eventually we're going to get to the point with a child where we teach them about the, the two Quran. And one of the Quran is to look at the universe and learn from it. Now, Allah does not trick us. Remember when I was talking about the, 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 the Christians with their creation science, uh, how they made the claim that uh, God created the world with the dinosaur bones in there to, to trick us so when we found them, we would have to say, well, uh, how could those bones that look like they're millions of years old have gotten in there? Uh, God must have put them there to test our faith. Well, you know, Allah doesn't seem to work that way. The way Allah seems to work is whatever you see, it is. And He wants us to, to live in a world and observe the world on that basis. So this is why I would say things like magic are not good for children. And there are many things that are fun in the world that are not good for children. I'm, I'm not even sure magic is good for adults. Uh, in, 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 in that, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel like I, I'm quite sophisticated in, in, in my understanding of the world and of logic and of uh, what, what is possible and what is not possible and, uh, and, and, and where the limits of science are. But then I, I have seen David Copperfield on, on TV, and I have seen him do things. One that stands out in my mind uh, is, is he was up on the edge of a building, and there's nothing higher than the building, so, I mean, it's not a building with like, there could have been something we can't see there. And he actually steps off the side of this high building and flies around a little bit in the air, comes back, and, 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 and while he's there, he flies through a, a loop, a, a hoop, so there can be no wires, right? And then he comes back onto the ledge. Now, ever since I saw that, it has been a little bit in my mind that maybe David Copperfield has somehow or other made some arrangement with Shaitan so that 
he could have some special power to do this. Now, I don't like having that thought in my mind because I think I'm wrong. I think David Copperfield knows a trick that I can't understand. But with a little kid, a little child, who, who, who doesn't know nearly as much about life and science and logic as I do, all sorts of things could get them to think in the same kind of way. And I don't think this is a good type of way. And I, I really regret myself having seen that. And, and, and every time I think about it, it bothers me that, that I think something that I know is so totally illogical that I can't help but, but think maybe, I think I know, I know it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem possible from a, from a logical point of view, but maybe. And I don't like to think but maybe because I don't like to think that we have a world where there are people making deals with shaitan to have certain powers like that. And I don't think actually the world is that way. So uh, my answer is I, I, I think the world would, we, would be better off without magic. So anyway, uh, we're going to, uh, you going to say something before we finish? And it is, by the way, a, a very deep level of lecture. I mean, th th these are sort of overview lectures. Th th those others are, uh, if anyone buys any and sees any, you will see it is a really deep look at all these things we are talking about. It's the basis behind everything I say to you. Basically, what I say to you here are the conclusions, the, the, uh, the, the lessons in the... Uh, in, in the, on the CDs are the reason I can say the, the conclusions that I say to you. By the way, there, there are actually the two books that I have written available. Um, uh, one on, on, on basically the cosmology and the origin of the universe, the other one on the laws of learning, with which, which we have been photocopied for 10 ringgit each. And, 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 uh, but what, what I have done on the CDs as I have included the new knowledge that I've gained since I wrote those a long time ago, plus I have Islamized the knowledge. I have explained how the knowledge in these books was, was actually I, I gained what, uh, before I was a Muslim over 25 years ago and, and wrote uh, so, so that there is a, a, an Islamic explanation to the secular knowledge that is in the books that you read. So don't be shocked by the books. They, they, they were written from a secular point of view. If there's any language or ideas in there, uh, it does say in the beginning, uh, Islam is always right and I am always wrong if there's a conflict. So anyway, ha ha have, your, have your break and come back in 15 or 20 minutes and we will talk some more about raising children.